Oh, hello. Um, today I'd like to do a demonstration involving some liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen and uh, distinguish the two for one property. Do a little board work involving some Lewis dot structures and then even do a molecular orbital diagram which we'll probably look at in a few days. Um, in front of us we have a uh, horseshoe magnet. You can think of this magnet as having a positive and a negative pole. Something I don't want to do would be to take a coin or a paper clip or another magnet and put it in here. It's a very strong magnet and it would lock into place. Usually what we have to do is take a hammer and chisel to knock it off. It's an old but very powerful magnet. Inside this doer, I have some liquid nitrogen. Ah, we breathe air in, we breathe it out. 78% of the air that we breathe in is nitrogen. The other doer, little one right here, contains some liquid oxygen. 21% of the air that we breathe in is, liquid, uh, is gaseous oxygen. So the liquid nitrogen has been cooled. This is nitrogen gas that's been cooled to about 198 degrees below centigrade, so it's in the liquid form. We also cool down the oxygen. It's a little bit warmer than that. Put some glasses on and uh, show you a little bit of liquid nitrogen. You might be familiar with this from some of the uh, thriller movies like Terminator 2 and such. So I'll pour some of the uh, liquid nitrogen out and it evaporates immediately. It hits the warm surface, the air evaporates. I'm going to take the liquid nitrogen and pour it through the horseshoe magnet. Give me a moment there. I'll kind of, how about this to focus and stuff? And, okay. This is the liquid nitrogen. I'm pouring liquid nitrogen through the magnet and nothing spectacular really happens. The nitrogen pours down through. It appears to be unaffected by the magnetic field. You're probably not noticing the liquid being attracted to either one of the poles. Just kind of pours on through. Hits the uh, warm surfaces and evaporates. Let me pour some liquid oxygen through the magnetic field. This little doer has some liquid oxygen. I'll go ahead and pour some oxygen into the magnet and something quite different happens. You could say that it's levitating. I'll put my hand underneath and no liquid oxygen is dropping through. It's suspended in space. It's attracted to the magnetic field. Unfortunately, because of the temperature of the room, it's nice and warm in here, it evaporates so it doesn't last very long. I'll have to go ahead and do that again. Let me pour some liquid oxygen. So it's very attracted to the magnetic field. We don't notice this occurring with oxygen gas in our lives. Oxygen gas is colorless. We don't see it. We don't see it being attracted to magnetic fields. But when we go ahead and cool it, we have our liquid. We see the demonstration. I'll do that one more time. A little bit of liquid oxygen. It has a slight blue tint to it. Now I do have a problem and that is I have a little bit of liquid oxygen left and oxygen is really quite reactive so I'd like to dispose of this properly. I think what I'll do is pour it on top of a piece of cotton that I have inside this dish. Now we have ourselves some oxygen and we have ourselves a fuel, the cotton. The cotton's made out of a lot of carbon and hydrogen and would burn nicely like, oh, like a petroleum product would. I'm going to take a match off to the side and get this burning and I'm just going to toss the match in here and we'll dispose of that liquid oxygen. That was quick. Dandruff. Have some little flakes all over the place. There might still be a little bit of uh, oxygen inside that dish. We'll check that by putting a little wood splint inside there and again being cautious. We want to dispose of that oxygen as not to remain inside the room. Look at that splint glow. Get rid of some of the oxygen that's uh, residual. And, uh, looks as though the, the little stick is on fire. Uh, these uh, meter sticks don't last very long in the chemistry department. I'm going to go ahead and extinguish it using some liquid nitrogen. Nitrogen's rather inert and it's going to displace the oxygen and extinguish the flame. There's a difference between the liquid oxygen and the liquid nitrogen. 
One was suspended in the magnetic field, the other was not. Let's see if we can explain why. Oh, a few moments ago I went ahead and put together some ball and stick or ball and spring models for oxygen molecule. We have a couple of oxygen atoms. And they're connected by two springs, which is a nice little model showing that we have a double bond. Let's quickly take a look at the periodic table of the elements and talk about what types of bonds we can expect in some small molecules. According to the periodic table of the elements, group 8 or 18 if you'd like to do that numbering system, these are the noble or inert gases. They don't form bonds very readily. Uh, Nobel Prize chemistry by Neil Bartlett was to go ahead and have xenon form some bonds. He roughed it up with some platinum fluorine complexes which are very, very uncommon. So we like to say that these typically form zero bonds. These, or the halogens, like to form one bond. Oxygen, sulfur, selenium like to form two bonds. Well, the trend continues. Nitrogen, three bonds. Carbon, four bonds. And boron breaks the trend. We don't get to say zero, one, two, three, four, five. Boron typically forms three bonds. It comes to play with only three valence electrons. So there aren't that many electrons there. And it's also very small. Nice little model showing that oxygen's forming two bonds. Oxygen's forming two bonds. It's a nice little model put together before with nitrogen atoms. A couple of nitrogen atoms hooked together by triple bond. Nitrogen atom, three bonds. Nitrogen atom, three bonds. We're following the rules. Let's take a look at building some Lewis dot structures for these. I started up on the board by showing a couple of oxygen atoms and they're apart. And the arrows are indicating that these oxygen atoms are going to come together. Oxygen is element number eight. I do not have eight electrons shown in my Lewis dot structure because oxygen is element number eight, but it only has six valence electrons. A quick and dirty way of getting at six valence electrons is to look at the group number. One valence electrons for group one. Two valence electrons for group two. We'll stay with the main groups. We'll make the big jump. Three, four, five, six. So oxygen's element number eight. Two core electrons leaving group six or six valence electrons. Seven valence electrons and eight valence electrons. A couple of oxygens coming together. I'm proposing up on the board at first that we're going to have this electron and this electron in the bonding region will form a single bond. Same picture up there except the oxygens have come together. I have a Venn diagram or I put circles around these oxygens with their assigned electrons. Nice arrangement. Oxygens, pair of electrons in the middle, single bond. It's a nice model. It doesn't quite follow experimental data. Lewis suggested perhaps we could have a higher bond order. In other words, instead of a single bond, we might do something like this. Move more electrons into the bonding region. This electron on our blackboard, we're suggesting a model, move it into the bonding region. Do the same for the uh, electron on the right oxygen. And the result? And I'll pause so that, you know. And the result, instead of having two electrons in the bonding region, we now have four. Let me do my circles or Venn diagram. The oxygen on the left came to play with six valence electrons. It likes to uh, abide by the octet rule. And we find that it has two, four, six, eight. Nice. The oxygen on the right came to play with six valence electrons. It is now assigned eight in our Venn diagram. The reason that we are increasing from six to begin with to eight inside these circles is we're doing covalency. We're sharing electrons. The four electrons in the middle are shared between the two oxygens. Two electrons makes a bond. Four electrons makes a double bond. Nice little picture showing a double bond and I'm including the lone pairs of electrons. Let me have you try the Lewis dot structure for this molecule. Would you please Fashioned after this, bring a couple of nitrogen atoms together with the correct number of valence electrons and see if you can put together a nice model. Oh, I'm hoping that you went ahead and put together a Lewis dot structure for the N2 molecule and 
ended up with a triple bond between the nitrogen.